Mr. President, Les Calvo, Tosimo, the rest of us, welcome. Not many people stood here today in this significant setting will realize that our friendship began on the 8th of October 2020 when you were the first ever head of state that I met as speaker. We hit it off immediately with much laughter over an English afternoon tea and, of course, trolley cakes. And we forged an instant bond despite wearing masks and being socially distanced at the opposite ends of a large table. Because like the rest of Europe, we were working out how to deal with COVID. Little did we know that our relationship would grow in such turbulent times. On the 24th of February, 2022, the second invasion of Ukraine began. On the 8th of March, 2022, there was another first for us both. I suspended the House of Commons so that you could address in Ukrainian through the screens in our chamber, which we still refer to them as Zelensky screens. The atmosphere was electrifying. You could hear a pin drop before you came online. A very, very rare thing in the House of Commons. You spelled out the horrors of the first 13 days of war. Your speech was devastating and powerful. Today, on the 8th of February, 2023, now deep into the war, we are honoured that you have put yourself at risk to address us and again shine a light on the fact your country is still fighting for its survival. This hall has been the place of many great historical events. Your presence here today adds another to them. The war, as you know better than any of us, has lasted for nearly a year. As you told us last year, this is a war Ukraine did not start and did not want. But it is a war you've had to fight and our commitment to support you and your people has not wavered. I was considering what could be said at this important occasion. I thought back to the 1990s. Then we hoped that all countries that emerged from the former Soviet Union could secure freedom and prosperity. There was a moment of hope over that time, and we knew it would be a long time that each country could choose its own destiny. It is a tragedy that Ukraine's efforts to bring freedom, prosperity to its people has been met with war and death. Last year, building on our friendship, I welcome your wife, Madame Zelenska, to Parliament to open deliberately a provocative exhibition. I wanted to ensure the experience of your people is kept at the forefront of our minds. I do not believe any of us in this room were complacent about the reality of conflict, but those displays shocked us. The images stayed with us. They brought home the horrors of war, horrors inflicted on your people, fighters, civilians alike, horrors which cannot be avoided or denied. I applaud Ukraine's refusal to forget what is you and your people are fighting for. In the words of the Ukrainian Eurovision winners, Kailusha Orchestra, they said, I always find my way home, even if all roads are destroyed. Fighting for a country is not fight, simply fighting for territory. It is a fight for home and for an ideal. The endurance of the people, the people of Ukraine, honours those ideals. Their refusal to allow war to destroy the humanity honours their ideals. Last, right, quite rightly, last year you said, Ukrainians have become big over the 13 days of this war. You have become even bigger in your determination, not just to fight for your country, but to stand by the ideals you are fighting for. We will not give up on those ideals. We'll continue to support you against that Russian aggressor. And I pledge here today 
in front of all of you, do all I can to keep the plight of Ukraine in the spotlight. Later this year, the UK and Ukraine will be united in music, but we will always be united in our unwavering belief in the power of democracy. Slava Ukraina. Mr. President, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. The people of the United Kingdom and their honorable representatives, all the people of England and Scotland, of Wales and Northern Ireland, of all the lands which have been home to brave souls since Europe came into existence. I have come here and stand before you on behalf of the brave, on behalf of our warriors who are now in the trenches under enemy artillery fire, on behalf of our air gunners and every defender of the sky who protects Ukraine against enemy aircrafts and missiles on behalf of our tank men who fight to restore our Ukrainian borders, on behalf of our conscripts who are being trained now, including here in Britain. Thank you, Britain. And who, and who will be then deployed to the front line, front line, skilled, equipped, and eager to win. On behalf of every father and every mother who are waiting for their brave sons and brave daughters back home from the war. Mr. Speaker, uh, you may, I think, well remember as roughly more than two years, two years ago, uh, we met with you here in Parliament. Great honor was for me. And we, I remember, we enjoyed tea. <laughs> we talked, of course. We talked a lot about our people and our, about our countries, about the British and Ukrainian political traditions. Mr. Prime Minister Rishi, when, I, when we had our meeting earlier today, and I said to you that I would tell you, I will tell a story in my address to the Parliament and a story about my feelings on my first visit to London as, as President in autumn 2020. The program was packed. Royal Highnesses William and Catherine and Buckingham Palace and aircraft carrier of the Royal Navy, the Westminster, of course, Downing Street, and of course, the war rooms. And uh, there is an armchair in the war room, the famous Churchill's armchair, and a guide and the guide smiled and offered me to sit down uh, on this armchair from which war orders had been given. And he asked me, how did I feel? And I said that I certainly felt something. But it is only now that I know what the feeling was. And all Ukrainians know it perfectly well, too. It is the feeling of how bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your bravery. Thank you very much from all, from all of us. Yes, please. That is for you. All applause for you. London has stood with Kyiv since day one. From the first seconds and minutes of the full-scale war, Great Britain, you extended your helping hand when the world had not yet come to understand how to react. Boris, you got others united when it seemed absolutely Absolutely impossible. Thank you. You, all of you, you all showed your grit and character back then. Strong British character. You didn't compromise Ukraine. And hence, you didn't compromise your ideals, and thus you didn't compromise the spirit of these great islands. Thank you very much. And of course, of course, everybody understands that our countries knew absolutely different times. Our nations defended freedom in the Second World War. The, the iron curtain divided us. Our people went through crisis and growth, through inflation and periods of social losses and social gains. It was tough, but we always found strength and stamina to move ahead and achieve results. This is the bedrock of our land and your traditions. Ukrainians and Brits defeated the fear of war and had the time to enjoy peace. No matter what we encountered on different, different stages of our, of our and your formidable history, and you, you and us, and the whole mankind achieved similar result, evil lost. evil lost. We will always come out on top of evil. This lies at the core of, of our, but also your traditions. However, the horizon never stays clear for a while. Once the old evil is defeated, the new one is attempting to rise its head. Do you have a feeling that the evil will crumble once again. I can see in your eyes now we think the same way as you do. We know freedom will win. We know, we know Russia will lose. And we, we really know the victory, the victory will change the world. And this will be a change that the world has long needed. The United Kingdom is marching with us towards the most, I think, the most important victory of our lifetime. It will be a victory over the very idea of the war. After we win together, any aggressor, it doesn't matter, big or small, will know what awaits him if he attacks international order. Any aggressor, any aggressor who will try to push the Bandaris by force, who will inflict destruction and death on other peoples, who will try to endure his dictatorship at the 
at the expense of other people's blood in criminal and unprovoked wars as the Kremlin does. Any aggressor is going to lose. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have already achieved remarkable results, and we must make every effort to turn our achievements into the foundations of the future global security, security architecture. The world, the world needs your leadership, Britain, just as it needs Ukrainian bravery. When the full-scale invasion began, we, together with you, Britain, and United States, and other allies formed a true coalition of friends. That is very important. You were among those very few who had helped before the large-scale invasion began, exactly as it will be necessary every time in the future to prevent aggression from happening. Your help was preventive. We must take these principles of preventive aid to those who are threatened with aggression and preventive sanctions against those who threaten aggression as basic principles of the world anti-war policy. We created a coalition of and law. Thank you. Of and law and javelin that stopped the advance of the Russian army from the first day of the invasion. We built the coalition of artillery rounds and a coalition of air defense, which allow us to save the lives of our children, of our people, of our civilians, our women, our elderly, and our cities from Russian, from Russian atrocious occupation and missile terror. We put together a powerful sanction coalition. And your leadership is protecting international legal order through sanctions against a terrorist state cannot be questioned. And we have to steadily, to steadily continue along this way until Russia is deprived of any possibility to finance the war. Most importantly, together with the G7, we brought about a coalition of values a coalition that protects the rule-based world order and human rights, a coalition that will work in such a way that over time there will simply be no gray areas in the world in which human life doesn't matter. In order for it to be so, there must be justice. Anyone who invests in terror must be held accountable. Anyone, anyone who invests in violence must compensate those who have suffered from terror. <laughs> terror, aggression, or, or other forms of state violence. Our proposals for the creation of a special tribunal for the crime of Russian aggression against Ukraine and special compensation mechanism which will compensate war losses at the expense of Russian assets are based on such, on such principles. Justice is one of 10 elements of the peace formula proposed by Ukraine and supported by Britain. I thank you for your readiness to invoke the formula Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. As I, as I already mentioned, Ukrainian soldiers are being trained in Britain, in particular to operate challengers. Your 
main battle tanks, and a, it's a tank coalition in action. And I thank you, thank you, Rishi. Thank you very much for this powerful defensive step for tank assistance. Thank you. The coalition of long-range missiles is the latest of all. It will allow us to make the evil, evil completely retreat from our country by destroying its headways deep in the occupied territories. And it's not just, I'm not speaking just about weapons. We proved together that the world truly helps those who are brave in defending freedom and thus paves, paves the way for a new history. A history of the world, history of the world that knows how to be quick in help, who knows how to be effective in defense, who knows how to remain principled in dark hours, who implements its treaties and arrangements in good faith, who does not allow perpetrators to enjoy, to enjoy immunity, who knows how to overcome veto when it's abused, who knows no fear and who knows how to win. This shall be the new reality of the free world, I'm sure. However, evil, evil, evil is still, is still around, around today, and the battle continues. Yes, we know how it's going to end and how we are going to feel on the day victory comes. Every day we continue to pay, to pay with lives. Pain and tears of bringing, for bringing victory closer with the lives of our, of our people, our heroes, whom we lose in battles, with the lives of our heroes who take life and death risks every day to save as many of our soldiers and civilians as possible. And today I will have the honor to be received by His Majesty the King. It will be a, a truly special moment uh, for me, for our country. And in particular because I will convey to him from all the, all the Ukrainians the words of gratitude for the support His Majesty showed to them when he was still the Prince of Wales. And I also intend to tell him something that is, I think that is very, very, very important, not only for the future of Ukraine, but also for the future of Europe. In Britain, in Britain, the king is a, a near force pilot. And in Ukraine today, every air force pilot is a king. For us, just, just for us, for our families. Because there are so few they are so precious that we, the servants of our kings, do everything possible and impossible to make the world provide us with modern planes to empower and protect pilots who will be protecting us. And I am proud of our Air Force. And I brought a present from them to you, Great Britain, 
Yes, please, open, please. Yes. Yes. To the speaker. Yes, speaker. I will. And it's, it's, I, I, I will explain. Is the helmet of a real Ukrainian pilot. He is one of our most successful aces, and he's one of our kings. And the writing on the helmet reads, we have freedom, give us wings to protect it. I trust, I trust this symbol will help us for our next coalition, coalition of the planes, and I appeal to you and the world with simple and yet most important words, combat aircrafts for Ukraine, wings for freedom. Great Britain, Great Britain, you and us both struggle for peace, but instead of we are forced to face the range that seeks to deprive us of peace and everything else that is valuable in life. Unfortunately, it is in human nature to allow evil mature. It then stands up against humanity. It then destroys and kills. It launches aggressions and breaks people's lives. You and us have already fought together against such evil. You and us already have the experience of defeating the evil that is generated by human nature. I'm not saying there will be, there will be no more wars after the war ends. No. It is impossible to completely erase evil from human nature. Yet it is in our power to guarantee with words and deeds that the light side of human nature will prevail. The side you and us share, and this stands above anything else. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your support and living a British Parliament two years ago, I thanked you for delicious English tea. <laughs> and I will be leaving the Parliament today, thanking all of you in advance for powerful English planes. By the way, it's almost five o'clock. God bless Great Britain and long, long live the King. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President, for being with us today and for the powerful address that you have just given. The bravery, resilience, and fortitude of you and your people 
is a great example to all. <laughs> Mr. President, this great hall in which we stand, with its walls first built more than 900 years ago, has seen many speeches from great and iconic leaders. Today's event will weave a new panel in that rich tapestry of history. Thank you. <laughs> Westminster Hall is at the core of the national life of our country and has played a prominent role in the development of our judicial system and our parliamentary democracy. But the story of this hall is also a tale of resilience and of remaining steadfast in the face of disaster. While fire raged around this site in 1834, destroying our old parliament, Westminster Hall stood proud. When during the Second World War, bombs rained on London, Westminster Hall remained largely undamaged, stoic in the face of great peril. This hall reminds us that in the face of challenge and conflict, symbols of our national identity and sovereignty will endure, giving powerful and visible hope to our people's during times of tribulation. In the same way, the endurance of your government and its institutions in the midst of a colossal threat to Ukraine continues to inspire your population and millions more beyond your borders. This endurance and inspiration rests in large part upon the leadership that you have demonstrated since your country was forced into this terrible conflict. <laughs> Mr. President, a conflict which you did not choose. Effective leadership demands the ability to respond to unpredictable challenges. Mr. President, in the extraordinary situation in which you were placed, visibility was essential. In testing times, leaders must be visible to their people. And from the outset last February, when bombs were falling on Kyiv, you were visible. Broadcasting from the streets of your capital, you reassured Ukrainians and indeed the world of the determination of your government in the face of violent aggression. Your leadership has been steadfast. In the early days of this conflict, some suggested that the Ukrainian state could not withstand the Russian threat and that the war would quickly end. In one of your broadcasts during the early bombardment, you famously said, we are all here. You did not leave. You showed the world that your government was still at work in Kyiv and was fully committed to the defense of Ukraine. Your people have followed this example with an inspirational display of bravery. Vision has also characterized your leadership. You have not only expressed your belief in the continuing ability of Ukrainians to withstand aggression, but 
have embodied that belief, offering hope of our reconstructed Ukraine playing its full part in the future of Europe. That vision will continue to sustain you and your people in the difficult times ahead. Finally, a great leader never gives up. Selflessness and bringing people together are the essence of leadership. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, you exemplify these qualities in abundance. We salute your determination, your resilience, your courage. So let me thank you once again, Mr. President, for your visit today. We wish you and the Ukrainian people success, strength, and fortitude. You are not alone in this struggle. This parliament, and indeed the country, stands with you in solidarity as you continue this noble fight. Thank you for your visit, Mr. President.
Well, let's turn to Anita and John once again. Um, and John, it's uh, a recession that's been uh, dodged, uh, as it were, delayed but um, not avoided, is what we're being told. Let's have a look at the um, times. The UK's not out of the woods yet. These are the words of Jeremy Hunt. Yeah, so obviously it's good news that the country is not yet in a recession, but you look at those figures for the fourth quarter of last year and absolutely no growth at all. It's uh, just only just dodged uh, going into a recession. And one of the interesting points made in that article in The Times is that even though there were times last year where the economy was growing, although not particularly in a strong way, the UK is the only European country in the G7 where the economy at the moment still hasn't got back to the level it was before the pandemic. And I think there's big questions about why hasn't that happened in our country? Why has the growth been a lot slower than in other places? And yeah, we may not be in a recession, but people are really feeling the hit at the moment. There was mention there in that piece about energy bills. We know that energy bills are due to go up by a fifth in April. And I think a lot of people just hearing that will just dread and just think they're struggling to make ends meet at the moment. The idea that energy bills can go up even more, I think people will just think, well, how on earth am I going to pay for that? Yes, and uh, Anita, as, as John's saying there, you know, technically not in recession, but people are still feeling it. Um, it's cold comfort to them, isn't it? Literally. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the pulse of Frank Luntz often says, like, it's about how people feel um, about whether there's a recession, because what, what does it technically mean that there are there haven't been two quarters of negative growth. Um, but what's really interesting about this, as John says, um, is that really the story of growth here is is not immediately evident, growth is expected to be close to zero in 2023. And not only is that a problem for um, you know, voters. Um, it's a huge problem for the government who want to, at some point, reduce taxes and help to um, shepherd the economy onto sunnier uplands. And also it creates a political problem for Rishi Sunak because there is a group of conservative backbenchers who vociferously would like to see more pro-growth policies. And that does explain, I think it's certainly, you know, the briefing in the I newspaper and certainly I'm picking up from my sources, Jeremy Hunt, screwing away in the department looking for more growth. But that story of the economy is going to dominate because what we saw in December of 2022 was deeply disappointing for the hospitality sector, but actually more widely because um, the, the, the size of the economy, when you compare December of 2022 to December of 2021, it was worse in 2022. Um, so this really is an extraordinary difficult time. So Jeremy's right to say we're not out of the woods. I would say we're quite deep in the Still. Mm. And John, questions turn to, to how exactly he's going to grow the economy. The eye looking at a, a couple of suggestions for the Chancellor. Yes, yeah, so as Denise says, a lot of the backbenchers on the Tory side are calling for tax cuts, but we know how that went with Liz Truss. With, she tried tax cuts and that didn't seem to be a particularly great way of helping. The government's also looking at other ideas. How do you get more people into work? The official unemployment number is 1.2 million. But actually, you look at the number of people who are working age who either aren't in work or not looking for work, and that's about 9 million people. And so that's why you see on the front page of The Guardian talk about how the Treasury is looking about could you increase the number of hours of childcare you give to people to help people into work, particularly young women who may be uh, struggling to increase their hours because of childcare. There's something that the Labour Party has been calling on. It's something that the CBI has been calling for. And it sounds like it's something they're looking at, although how generous the policy will be, I think that is more of a question. And also there's uh, talk about whether you help people who are out of work by doing more work coaches. I think the issue with that is, yeah, that could be great if you are really encouraging people into work that suited them. But if it's a one-size-fits-all approach, that may not be so handy. 
Yes, the I list of uh, things to be done to boost the economy, cut taxes, raise spending, ease labour shortages, deregulation and reform planning. I wonder if the um, Chancellor will be having a read of that. Anita and John for the moment, uh, thank you. Coming up, we'll have a full run-through of tomorrow's front pages and discuss more of the day's news. Do stay with us if you can.